Thank you. So during the meeting, all participants will be in control of their own microphone. Please ensure that you turn your microphone on when you are speaking and remember to turn it off when you are finished. All reports published as part of the agenda will be considered as read by members of the panel. Published reports will therefore be summarized to allow the panel to focus on questions. Item one, apologies for absence. I have had apologies from Councillor Merrill and Joy Besham of Greenwich Health Watch. And I have apologies from Councillor Hartley for leaving early. Do I have any other apologies from any members? No, nope. okay, so we'll move on to urgent business. I have not received any notification of any urgent business. Does anyone wish to make me aware of any? No, nope. okay, declarations of interest. Members are asked if there are any declarations of interest other than those already listed in the documents. No, nope. okay, so item four, are there any issues arising from the minutes of the last meeting on the 13th of July and the 1st of March? Can we take those as agreed? Okay, um, I suggest we take a pause uh, whilst we wait for the cabinet member. No need, she's walked into the room. Okay, um, if you want to get yourself uh, prepared, and we'll come to you in a second. My understanding is that I give an update about what's going on, what happened over the last six months um, since I did my last update and then actually <clears throat> look forward to what, um, what I hope to accomplish or how I would like things to um, go moving forward. Um, we, as a department, we're still under tremendous pressures, especially budgetary pressures. Um, with addressing health inequalities, um, which I will talk about in my presentation. Um, but we did make some headways, which we can be very proud of. Um, but still, there are, there are pressures on our department um, because our population is changing. Um, people have much more complex needs and things like that. Um, we realize that people's health is essential for them to live their best lives and are committed to solving issues as well as being involved with prevention too. That's very key to what we want to do for our residents. Uh, at the same time, we realize we can't do this alone. Um, it's not just us doing it. We're working very closely in collaboration with our partners. And some of the partners include the NHS, Charlton Athletic, Metro Gav, Health Watch. We also have the Healthy Greenwich Partnership, which also helps us um, try to achieve some of our goals. Our efforts has focused on improving um, health, improving things through healthy food, enhancing mental health service, promoting physical activity, and reducing unfair disparity in health and well-being. And as I said at the top, there are still very strong budgetary pressures. Demand is growing in, in adult social care. Um, um, the pressure is on the budget, so uh, in, uh, over, over, we, we are overspent, uh, 3.4 uh, million, which is the outturn of 22-23. Uh, that's still a budgetary pressure. It's an improvement from a few years ago. So in 2019-2020, it was 14 million. So that improvement is good, but the pressures are still on. Um, some of the things driving the, the numbers are, are increased population, and this population with much more complex needs, plus inflation. So inflation um, as you know, it's been in double digits for quite some time. 
but what it's some, about 80% of our budget uh, is, is to do with adult social care spend. So some of the providers have come back and tried to renegotiate things and it's ended up with us pushing back with them too. Um, so that, that battle was still ongoing, um, but uh, we're, we're quite glad it's not as high as it was in the past, uh, the overspend. And some of the reasons why it's not high is that we brought in our forward thinking program. Well, some of you, I, I wasn't around in the portfolio, but um, we had Newton that came in and they helped go through line by line of our, of our services. Um, and at the same time, we put in our forward thinking program with our adult vis service vision, which helps us to keep, um, keep um, some of our costs down, but not at the cost of residents. Um, it still keeps um, things like, we use things like reablement, which is very beneficial for our residents, which is a free service that we offer to res residents. We also look at modernizing our learning disability, which is all part of that program, as well as look at things like children's, how children progress into adult services. And if we do it in the right way, um, it means that we don't incur those extra, extra costs that sometimes happens with it, as well as things like assistive technology. So that's all part of the forward thinking program, and that work is continuing on, um, and it's definitely part of my work, uh, the work that we will be doing moving forward. Um, let me just, there's a lot going on in my portfolio, so I'm going to just touch on a handful, that's it. Um, so the carer strategy we signed off on over a year ago. We're really proud of that. Carers do a lot for our borough. Uh, actually, they do a lot for the country. They cost, they save governments, and including us, lots and lots of millions of pounds uh, for doing a job that they don't get paid for. Uh, right now, we know of 24,000 people who've been identified in the borough as carers, but only about 1,000 of them actually actively engage with the council. About 2,000 engage with the Carers Centre, so the Carers Centre in Charlton, who was specifically um, created to work with carers, and about five to 6,000 engage with Mobilize, which is an online app. Um, but moving forward, we want to do a lot more um, advertisement and try and promote what we offer and what we can do for carers, um, you know, so that they know that. So, so some of them are simple things, like if they go to the doctors, to tell them, when they go to the doctor, to, to say to the doctor, I am a carer, so that they note it on their file, which means that the doctor can actually look for specific things just for carers and things like that. So things like that need to be promoted a lot more, which we're going to be involved with. So as I said, it's the first year of our carer strategy, and we worked with carers to create that strategy. And we're trying to work much more with the carers at the center of some, a lot of the things that we do. So we do have a carers board meeting. In fact, I have one tomorrow, and I made it very clear that the carers were the ones that would chair this meeting, and that they would help us with the agenda. And, um, and actually, they've, they've actually absolutely, many of them who did have been able to do the chairing, um, um, they've absolutely enjoyed it. But it also means that the conversation is directed more about what they care about rather than what, because initially I was going to chair it, and they asked, the officers asked me to chair it, but I said, no, it's got to be the carers, because um, they know what, what needs to be. And also that meeting, the board meeting, is very important because it looks at the strategy. We look at different parts of the strategy in that board meeting to say, where do we need to keep working on and what do we need to keep, continue to do? Um, the Innovation Grant, um, really proud of that program. So the Innovation Grants um, were given out actually over a, year, over a year ago in January 22, between January 22 to March 23 this year. And that was a one-time off grant that's gone to particular groups within Greenwich. And their whole goal is to, to tackle health inequality and, and mental well-being. Um, so there were 75 projects that were given funding, and these 75 projects uh, reach anywhere of 6,000 residents, uh, which included over 400 families. So we're really proud of that. We did some promotion to do with uh, the work that some of the people did. And some of them were first-time receivers of funds. Um, and the thing is, when you get the community involved with this part, they're the ones that can really get down into those areas of health inequalities that sometimes as a council we can't always reach. 
Um, so some of the work, also our assisted technology work uh, continues. Um, we've had a, a, an organization or a business called Rethink Partners talking to not just residents, but also our social care staff, as well as some of, the, um, some of our officers. And uh, some of the work that uh, Rethink have been doing is look at what ambitions do people have? What do they want the technology to do? Uh, that's really important that we ask that question. We also, also, they're also looking at existing technology um, to see how well or how not so well it's working and at the same time identify where we can find savings. But at the same time, as I said before, keep residents at the heart of everything and so that their health and well-being improves and that we can work better together. Um, we recently got awarded borough um, sanctuary status, which is really uh, a lot. I know a lot of members are very excited about it because we did pass a motion, uh, two motions in full council. Um, um, so this, the borough sanctuary uh, actually sends a very strong message that we support migrants, asylum seekers and, mig and, and, and immigrants. Um, but not only that, it allows us to um, embed a policy um, throughout every department so that the, we can identify things like funding and approaches to different things to do with um, borough sanctuary. So we are looking to continue to embed the policy, but at the same time, we do want to sort of uh, celebrate it a little bit, but we want to work closely with the migrant community with designing that celebration about what it should look like and their voice and their stamp should be on it uh, rather than myself or, or, or officers. So we're gonna work with them uh, with some ideas that they wanna do uh, to actually do a, big, a much bigger announcement. Um, so, um, but the committee that decided it decided unanimously and said that we had some very model, some very model work, that pr good practice in that area that they would like to promote and, and share with other councils. Um, Self-directed support workshops. So the council hosted a series of workshops with people with lived experience of care to discuss self-directed support service. And that's all about uh, residents having more control over their care. Uh, so we, we are very much about in, encouraging that. I, I think that leads to better outcomes and better health and well-being when people feel like they have control over their lives. And so this is part of that. Um, in terms of adult safeguarding, um, we do have an adult safeguarding board, which we are legally required to have. It's, technically, it's an independent board uh, that's chaired by is it Michael, Pres Michael Prescott Shoots. Sorry, I can't always remember his name. I just call him Michael, so I don't always know his last name. Um, and he's an independent chair. Uh, so what happens is safeguarding cases come before that committee. Some of them are quite tragic cases and sad cases that pretty much no one cares about, no one ever comes to the town hall for, but these cases have reached a certain threshold, not all cases, but they reach a certain threshold, they're reported to us, and sometimes we look at it to see where the failure is and see how we can implement them. And so on the safeguarding board, it's not just the council, it's the police, it's the fire, it's our different partners are on there too. But also another part of it is we look at trends and things and patterns. And one of the things we've looked at is hoarding and self-neglect. So I know some of you may get that in your casework. And I know I, this week I did hold, not this week, last week, I held a special session um, to actually combine with, because last week, the, the last cabinet meeting, we passed this, the um, adult safeguarding report. And in that report, it highlighted hoarding and self-neglect, which actually can point to many adult safeguard uh, safeguarding issues and we held a conference last year um, so um, I recently gave um, a presentation last week well Michael actually did more than me and Nick um, did a presentation about some of the work we're doing in the council in this area uh, so some of the things that we notice with self-neglect is sometimes you might get a casework of someone that's got loads of junk pun up in their house you might get a neighbor and then sometimes some, some, that person ends up in an accident, they go to the hospital, the house belongs to the council, they come in, they clear the property out, then the person goes back in the house, and then a few years later it comes back again. So it was really kind of getting different departments to speak to each other to see if there's something we can do at the strategic level 
so that we um, may be able to like, um, either halt or actually try and intervene much more earlier in, in different situations. So we're piloting some stuff to do to see how, how much we can do, um, because some of the work of what we do is about averting and stopping that. And just lastly, I'll just talk briefly about mental health. Uh, so uh, about a week or so ago, the Health and Wellbeing uh, made an, had a meeting in Kidbrook, and we had some of our partners there talking about some of our work that we were doing in health, uh, in, in mental health. Um, some of it included our suicide strategy, which uh, I don't know if some of you saw. We're doing a big promotion about the suicide um, prevention. Um, and some of you may have seen uh, your co-colleague, Lade, in, in a video uh, about that. So we're refreshing our suicide strategy, but at the same time trying to have a, a, a very uh, a refreshed approach to mental health too. So hopefully that's just a gallop through quite a lot of things. I didn't cover everything in my portfolio, but that's about it. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, Without much further ado then, I'll open it up to councillors for questioning over the report from the Cabinet member. Councillor Hartley and then uh, Councillor St. Matthew Danu. Thank you for the report, very useful, and thank you for the written report in advance. Really rich data, really well presented, very helpful to us all in scrutinising the portfolio. Thank you. Um, I've got a question about carers and social isolation. So um, the, the ASCOF metric of proportion of carers who reported they have as much social contact as they like has, has kind of stayed around the same. It's gone up slightly. It's 2018-19, it was 23.1. 2021-22, it's 24.8%. And when we've looked at this in previous years, and there was a piece of work when Councillor Lacau was in a, your role where we did a trial on the Cold Arbor Estate or after that, Greenwich against loneliness motion that you'll remember we passed um, and that had some really positive results so I guess the question is how are the results of that trial and other uh, social isolation initiatives for carers specifically um, how is that being scaled up and also secondly um, back then it was really stark that Bromley uh, next door very different demographics clearly was performing a lot more strongly on that specific measure about percentage of carers who feel they have as much social contact as they like. And so it, that's still the case. I've just looked at the figures. They're, they're at 36%, we're 24%, so a big difference. So are we in touch with Bromley about seeing what they can, what we can learn from them in terms of getting in touch with carers, making sure that we're putting in place the right interventions? So kind of a two-part question. Okay, so I hope you don't mind me bringing officers on because some of this covers time when um, I wasn't in charge. Um, I think once some of the thinking behind the strategy, the strategy is just brand new, was that we needed to improve things and to be, only to improve things at the strategic level can we actually see that change and that growth and that change in those, in those numbers. And you're right, uh, for many carers, um, they are isolated and they are, and they are alone. And I, when I attended the launch event, it... For many people, we have the launch event in this room here, and many of them um, came just for one hour, and that was the only time they got a chance to be with someone or be outside from their situation. So it's something that's very, very, very important to us, um, which is, explains why I said to you that um, what they offer to the borough in terms of saving money, but at the same time, their well-being is really, really important. Um, and um, no matter how old they are, whether they're very young or, 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 or elderly, um, it's very important. So the reason why we did the strategy and the reason why um, we felt like it was really important was to deal with things like that. Um, it's sad that we haven't seen the shift in the numbers yet, but I th I, I'm confident if we continue on that path, um, we, we, we will see improvement. We are going to do more broadcasting, as I said in the report, about what is available for carers because from the numbers you can see um, only a very small group of carers and that's people who identify as carers not everyone identify themselves as carers because you know it, you have to be very comfortable with that with that role um, so only a small group of the that we are that we know about um, actually um, engage with the council in all sorts of ways, or engage with the carer centres that does actually have social events and things for carers. Uh, but if I could hand off to officers to answer some of the detailed technical questions. Thanks. Um, and, and that's a really good question uh, from Councillor Hartley. Um, I think what I'd say is there has been a bit of an improvement in 21-22. 
we're doing this, we're repeating the survey as we speak, so the survey's out, and I would expect that the impact of some of the work that's been done through the carer's strategy should start to uh, show in the figures for 22, 23, which will be the, um, sorry, 23, 24, which will be the, the survey year that we're in, um, <clears throat> because I think the, the benchmarking is still from 21, 22. But I suppose, practically speaking, De Denise mentioned um, uh, Mobilize, for example, which is an online interactive platform which is available outside of hours um, when carers might be able to engage with that. And I know that's an online platform, but I think the fact that we've had a lot of uptake and investment in that um, should show. And we've had some um, innovation grants around this carer strategy as well to try and get more um, uh, work to connect people to, you know, to communities, to connect into things like Live Well and the wider strategies around social isolation that exist within the borough and Steve may want to touch on. But it's all about connecting into things that are already there. And to be honest as well, our social care practitioners, you know, we can see in our figures, we're not getting the number of carers assessments that are comparable perhaps to other other boroughs so we know we've got work to do with our you know our, our social workers out of covid um and we're doing a lot more face-to-face -face visits um but that connection in to some of the rich resources we've got in the borough and making sure that those connections are there is really important i think what we often see is carers not wanting to be identified as a carer or dealing with a crisis so i think there's more we can do at the review stage when we're reviewing carers um, and their needs to connect them in. So there's a lot of work going on. I still think there's a lot of work to, you know, to, to go to get to the, to the point that we'd want to. So this, the, the ambitions there and it's outlined in the strategy. And those are, I think, a few of the things that I'd point to. That's, that's really helpful. And, and on the Bromley point specifically, and I appreciate you can pick a borough, right? And boroughs are so different. Um, there's no comparable data, for example, for Lewisham, which might be a, a, kind of a better comparison. Um, but given that, you know, it, it's 50% higher, um, th that metric, and Bromley kind of sticks out as a really high performer. Have we spoken to Bromley uh, about their approach? I mean, I haven't spoken to them recently, so it's certainly a suggestion I can take back and make sure that we, we have that conversation with them, yeah. Councillor uh, St. Matthew Daniel. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was going to ask a similar question along with what um, Councillor Matt asked regarding the carers about having 24,000 that we know of could be more. And I just wanted to know, are there any information online at all regarding carers that we can perhaps share with people? And also, um, what is... The idea of changing the name, perhaps, from carers to another name. I don't know whether we've carried out a survey regarding that. Um, and also, um, Councillor Denise, you mentioned innovation grant that it was only for a year. Is there any chance of that continuing, perhaps? Because it was quite successful last year with 75 participants. Um, right, the hoarding and self-neglect, what is the waiting list for that? Because I've received several people um, saying that I think the waiting list is six months. And what does the success rate for that look like, please? Okay, just clarification. When you say waiting list for hoarding, what do you mean? What, um, what, what? People are referred to some kind of self-help adult social services for okay. hoarding and self-neglect. So I just wanted to know what the waiting list is and what is the process to completing some kind of steps and what does success rate look like, okay. please? Thank you. Okay, so I'll answer as many of them as I can and then- Sorry, can you just remember to turn your microphone off, please? I'll answer as many of them as I can and then um, I will um, hand for especially some of the detailed question. So in terms of stuff that share online, we do have stuff that's online. We're at the same time, we're actually doing an audit 
of some of, because it's not just what's online, there are other organizations who are doing things and we're, we're actually doing an audit of what information's out there so that we can um, make sure that it's um, all in one place or where people can get it. So we're still working on that um, and that's, and that's um, good. Uh, Kara's name, now okay, I, I don't, uh, I don't want to change a name. I'd rather talk to the carers. I think they should be the ones that decide that. I mean, I'm happy to change it if, if they feel um, that um, a different name would help. Um, and I, I'm happy to do that. Um, but go ahead. I was just going along the line of Steve when he mentioned that people don't like to be identified as carers. And I just wanted to know whether perhaps, as you've said, carried out a survey to carers to find out whether the name would help. So I'm gonna let officers answer that one, see if they, if they know that if we have asked that question. But you're right, I mean, there are people who don't identify as carers, even though they are uh, carers, uh, especially, some, especially young people who are caring for a family member. They may not, uh, they may not identify as that. Um, but I'll, I'll let them answer. Um, and innovation grant, I'm gonna hand that off to um, you guys. And then. So, so just to add to what Denise said about the information that's available online, we're just, uh, we're just about to relaunch the Greenwich Community Directory, um, which is a, a, an online repository of, of information for all, all residents in the borough, but um, sort of their, their specific information that uh, carers can access as part of that. And it's been completely revamped, brought in-house, and I think made much more accessible, more user-friendly. Um, the testing that's been done with, with residents and with service providers have, uh, has been very positively received. So hopefully that will, that will be helpful for people who use online routes to finding um, information and, and services. Um, in terms of the Community Innovation Grant, uh, of the 75 projects that were funded through that first round, uh, we, we did some evaluation with them and asked them what, what because they, they covered a very wide range of different groups within the population, from parents of children with disabilities, older people with dementia, um, different groups from different um, eth ethnic backgrounds, um, a wide range of different things, as you can imagine, with 75 um, groups funded, and lots of things like arts and dance uh, activities. Uh, we asked them what, what the main kind of topics were that came up for the the residents who engaged with, with the, the, each of the different service areas. And actually the number one that came out in the word cloud that was the product of that exercise was social isolation. So it was something that cut across all of those different population groups um, uh, and, and you know, was, was, was the most commonly identified issue. Um, uh, things around mental health and well-being, around financial um, uh, concerns were, were some of the others, but that, that sort of social isolation issue um, was part of that. And, and I think there were also some carers um, projects that were part of that 75 cohort. In, in relation to whether we're going to do it again, um, some of that was, was some legacy money from the pandemic that we, uh, we had um, available. Uh, and uh, matched with some with some NHS funding and some public health um, underspend for that particular year. So it's not a, an ongoing um, pot that we've that we've got, and obviously we're facing very difficult financial uh, situation as a, as a, as an authority, as all authorities are going forward. However, having said that, Neil, who will be coming later. Um, has has a, a a grant scheme that is about to launch for the next five year period uh, with fi with five million pounds worth of funding associated with it, which is a very similar model to the one that we we undertook with the community innovation grant, so particularly focused around health inequalities and mental health and well being and um, it, that, that's that 's come from a charitable an NHS charitable fund that 's specifically um, associated with Greenwich, so it's money for this borough for that period of time, and as I say, it's quite a, a decent amount of money. So the intention is that there will be pro projects of a similar sort of nature funded um, 
by gra from grassroots, small, small to medium and grassroots organisations in the borough over that, over that period of time. So I th hopefully that will feel like a very similar kind of successor to, to what we did last year. Thanks. Um, and just picking up on the, a couple of the points. So um, in terms of um, the online piece, again, I mentioned Mobilise, and I will circulate the details of Mobilise because they're a really good online um, offer for carers, very accessible. And it's not about you necessarily identifying as a carer. It's an offer of support and peer support. Um, in terms of asking people about the name carers, I think our practitioners, our workforce, to try to... To, to look at what people's strengths and needs are and rather than labeling them. And so that's the approach they take in assessment terms. We have to go through um, particular assessments for particular things, but it's about having a conversation rather than uh, having a label. In terms of the um, self-neglect and hoarding, we've only just established a panel, uh, which is a cross-disciplinary panel. That's only just launched in the last month. Um, so individual departments, um, this is what we found through the work, perhaps in housing, perhaps in social care, are taking the lead on working with particular individuals. The idea of the panel is to bring those professionals together, especially where there are some complex cases, um, and work on a solution together. So there's no waiting list for that panel, but there's quite a high demand for that panel, but that works just... Um, just starting and what's really exciting I think about the work is the development of a peer group um, because it's been f found to be the case that um, peers who are struggling with um, hoarding um, uh, behaviours uh, you know really get a lot from having a peer group to support them as they work through that um, so I think those were those were the yeah. those were the, that covers the I just say a little bit more about the peer group so can I? Briefly, just I want to move on to Councillor Farhi. He's had his hand up for some time. Okay. So the peer group, um, we, the council have just started a campaign. I don't know if you've seen some of the stuff that's gone on Twitter or whatever, but it does ask people if, if they want to get involved with it. But the peer group is also it's done with the support of the London Fire Brigade, Oxleys, uh, us, as well as WhatsApp. And that's uh, Woolwich Service users too. So... Um, you know, if, if you do know someone, you can always point them to the peer group, and then that way that might, it's a safe environment where they can actually have some, a conversation about it. Could I suggest that uh, an action point would you be to you to circulate to members of, of the council information about how they might make referrals to that system if they have casework that's relevant? Yeah, happy to do that. I hope you saw the slides. I did the self-hoarding workshop with Nick and... and, and uh, and those slides are very, very useful. So um, those, those are, I, I'm happy to recirculate those again too, as, w along with the links. Thank you. I think that's a very interesting topic and perhaps one that uh, a future scrutiny panel might look at those pilots. Councillor Fahi. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you so much for the report. I've got three questions, if I might. Um, I understand that the Clover Medical Centre closed its doors uh, some two weeks ago uh, with um, 2,000 uh, patients left without a GP. Uh, do you know what's happened to those 2,000? And are they likely to get a GP service sooner rather than later? Uh, no put appreciation your comment regarding the borough of sanctuary. My understanding is that a number of um, uh, asylum seekers have now got the right to stay uh, in the UK and were living in accommodation uh, in uh, hotels in the borough and are seeking accommodation from the council. Um, can you advise us as to what mechanisms are being put in place to support them uh, in terms of their accommodation needs? And the final question is relating to carers and um, uh, recognise and appreciate your comment with regard to uh, the carer centre, which is a uh, um, a model of excellence in my view uh, in the borough and we should be grateful for that um, the question of young carers has become a national issue uh, in recent months and uh, are we aware of the number of young carers uh, currently uh, supporting their loved ones in the borough and what additional support if any are we giving them 
in order to ensure that their lives are not disrupted as much as um, as less than we would want it to. Thanks. Um, may I just add a, an addendum to the question, uh, if I may, Councillor Fahi, around the borough of sanctuary? Um, I'm sure as you're aware that the rules around how long you can remain in home office accommodation once your claim has been granted have been reduced. Um, I'd just like to know how we are taking account of that. How many people in the borough do we know are more likely to become homeless as a result of the time being reduced, I believe, from 30 days to seven? All right, okay, so I'll do my best to answer uh, uh, some of them and then I'll, I'll let um, Steve and Nick go into some of the details. So in terms of the carers, we are aware that there are some carers and actually some of them are actually engaged in um, our carers group, our carers board in particular. There's one young man um, named Michael who uh, became a carer when his mother had a jogging accident and his mother was totally healthy, and uh, she fell, uh, but in, in, in a sense ended up completely with him taking care of her, and he's a very young uh, person, and he actually actively gets engaged, and he's been actually very useful for us to get information about what it's like being a young person, um, and he had to put his university um, stuff on hold. Um, so, but we are working with as many of them as possible, um, sometimes I have conversations with Matt Morrow about it. Now, I don't know specifics to do with numbers, but I'm sure um, if Nick or, or, or Nick has, might have had more information about that. In terms of the borough sanctuary, it's actually quite sad that we have, because um, it's very much the Home Office has changed it, and we have um, actively, um, especially in our meetings with the Home Office, um, engaged with them about um, this change in their policy of sorts. Now, internally in the council, I'm trying to work with uh, Councillor Pat Slattery, who does housing, to do with what, what the approach should be and what we should be doing on that. And I know both of us are going to be uh, releasing a joint statement about what needs to happen. Um, and I'm sorry, I've been away at... Um, uh, so I haven't had a chance to um, get to that. So I'm happy to release that probably sometime tomorrow. Um, which will be a joint statement, uh, which I know was crafted between myself, between Peter, who does the asylum seekers work, as well as with Sean, that works in housing. So we'll, with more clarification about what um, we can do in that area, um, I know that when we've um, Nick and I met with the home, meet with the Home Office, we've made it very clear for them to actually. Um, provide us more information about uh, when not people are going to be released and um, and what happens to them. But um, they have not been very forthcoming. Um, but we'll continue to ask those questions about it. Now, Sean's in those meetings too when we are talking to the Home Office. Um, but I do have to let you know they have not been um, very helpful. And even one of our last meetings, they sent someone that was very much lower on the, in the pecking order who couldn't answer any of our questions. Um, but we do meet with the Home Office and we do ask them those questions. So when I say we, it's not just um, Nick, it's also public health and it's housing um, and enforcement who also meet there, meet too. Um, now, the Clover Clinic, we've got Neil coming. He can give you the latest um, information and update on that. Um, you know, so um, my understanding from the last briefing I got, which was a, a, about a month or so ago, was that everything was on track. Um, so, and many of the patients had been, um, many of the patients had, um, um, had got, um, referred to other doctors and things like that. But he's the only one I know that can give us the most latest information on that. Um, so um, I don't know if you guys want to say anything more. Thanks, Darth. Um, you've covered that very comprehensively. Um, I think the only thing to add would be on the carers and the young carers, um, we work very closely with children's services and when we review the carers' strategy, um, the, um, the idea is to have that as a joined up strategy, which includes young carers as part of that as well. Um, so that, that's, the next, that's the next step. But certainly children's services colleagues would be able to provide some additional information. We could get that 
about the services and the offer for young carers. I think Denise has highlighted um, where we see young carers coming through transition and how we need to work in a more joined up way. And then, yeah, in, in respect to the borough of sanctuary, we do meet six weekly with the Home Office. We do ask them for an early, early indication of when people are gonna get their leave to remain and to work more closely with us. We've got a meeting on Monday and we'll do the same, uh, have asked the same question then. But Denise uh, is briefing note with, between Denise and Pat will come out and that will articulate um, the, the legislative framework around which, you know, if, if notice is given, what the response from housing, the, the housing authority is locally. So I can just say, I can say a little bit more on, on Clover, um, but as Denise has said, it's, it's a, it's an ICB responsibility and, and Neil would have the, the very latest position, but my, my understanding was that when the decision was taken not to continue commissioning the Clover service, that they identified a number of other practices that had capacity and were willing to take um, additional patients. Ferryview being um, chief amongst that in terms of the number of patients and Ferryview is obviously very close geographically to where the Clover um, practice was operating. Um, so I think all, all patients have been offered the opportunity to register with, 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 with other practices and I think given the choice. Uh, but as I say, Neil, Neil could give you um, a kind of the, the current picture. And I'm sure if there's any examples of where people feel that they haven't got um, access to a practice or they're not sure what the op what the op offer is that that neil would be very pleased to, to hear about that i think was we have neil coming on the next item we can move to that in the next item uh councillor Becken. hello thank you so much for the report and um, my question is about the ask off measures um on page 48 um and it was just seeing the rise in permanent admissions of people aged 18 to 64 um, in residential, uh, permanent admissions of people aged 18 to um, to residential and nursing homes. Unless I'm reading that wrong, it seems to have risen by 116.9%. And permanent admissions of people aged 65 and over to residential and nursing homes per that 100,000 has ri risen by 15.7%. I was wondering how much is that impacted by um, issues in securing appropriate care within the community because we all know kind of about the issues there and is that meaning that because that can't be secured that people are more needing to be um, looked after in, in permanently in residential um, facilities and kind of the reasons behind that increase. Um, my second question, I'm not sure if this is really appropriate to ask but it would just be great to maybe get an update from Steve about the French bed bugs and um, what steps the borough is taking um, in terms of preventing those. I mean, it's been all over social media and even it's making me a bit worried to sit down on public transport, even these chairs now. I keep thinking about them, so I um, just wanted to ask selfishly. Thank you. All right, because those are two quite technical questions, I will hand over. So I'll start on the, the placement, so I'll leave Steve for the, for the latter. But um, the, um, I, th I think in terms of the, it's a really good question. Um, in terms of the rise in permanent admissions for people 18 to 64, um, that, that, that tends to be, um, that obviously that's younger people, working age people. And so I haven't got the, the figures here, which would probably be helpful to provide you with. They're smaller, the small numbers, so a small change in that number can result in it appearing to be a very large increase, but I can give you the denominators, if you like, behind those numbers. Um, but we are working hard on um, making sure that there's enough, uh, su you know, supported and independent accommodation for people who have mental health or learning disabilities um, and, and require that sort of support. So we're looking at independent means of living. Um, so if I can come back to you with the figures on that one, if that's okay, in terms of the uh, 18 to 65s. Um, it would just be more, yeah, and it would be helpful, the kind of drivers behind that yeah. um, as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think what we've, what we've, but what we're not doing is placing younger people in institutional settings, um, you know, in, in large numbers. We're moving away from that 
you know, model and looking at independent living and developing more independent living options. Um, so, so I can give you, the, I can give you the figures on that, and I think you'll see in this next year that those have reduced as well because um, a, a, that that was a, a, an in-year um, uh, factor. It, likewise, with the permanent admissions 65 and over to residential and nursing care, I'd say the driver for that is acuity rather than and, and levels of need rather than um, us not having the ability to uh, enable people to go home first, which is our approach. Last year, we saw a particular rise in residential and nursing placements compared to previous years. That's reduced this year, um, and you know, but the, one of the drivers there in, is, as I say, in terms of the increase, um, people in, with higher levels of need needing a residential or nursing placement um, we, we've, we're very clear that we've got our reablement services, we've got lots of home care provision, um, and so we've, we're well provided to enable people to go home first. Um, but there's some volatility in some of those figures at times. Bed bugs. So I, I'd encourage you not to be too anxious about them at, at, at the moment. Um, I don't have a huge amount to say, but I am, I am at a meeting tomorrow with uh, a, a regional meeting with the UK Health Security Agency who would be in charge of, of considering what the risks are and what the responses need, need to be. So um, I will be appraised of their expert opinion come this time tomorrow, but uh, I, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it tonight. Thank you. And um, just quickly on the borough of Sanctuary, so um, I'll be sending out a briefing, but we also will be organising, um, if members want um, a, a separate briefing, where they, we'll have both housing and people from um, uh, the borough of Sanctuary team or the adult social care team. So, um, so once I've sent the briefing out and there's a, there are questions, then we'll do a separate one for members. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to the sort of second half of this first item, which I believe is a, is a canter through uh, the health data for Greenwich. Um, I, you have a presentation, I do believe, or do you wish us just to speak to the presentation that's in the papers already? So, I, was, I was just going to say, in terms of the, I think, uh, just to be, colleagues have covered off a lot of the ASCOF and the social care measures, so I won't. Um, I won't yeah, present skip those, those. Um, but I'll pass to, pass to Steve if that's... <laughs> but what, what, what I'd, while Steve's just saying it, what I would say on the ASCOF and the, and the other social care indicators, really happy to answer any questions outside of the meeting if you know, there's a lot of data in there. Um, and the ASCOF measures are a survey and um, that happens annually, and the other items are more of our operational indicators, and I think they just point to a lot of the work that Denise has outlined as being our priorities, carers, people with learning disabilities moving into employment. So just to segue to Steve, I thought I'd uh, highlight that. Thanks. So um, what you have is uh, a, a profile with a sort of selection of public health um, outcome indicators for our population uh, generally benchmarked against the England average and identifying where we are uh, doing worse than the England average, where we might be doing better in some cases and where we're broadly in line with the England average. Um, so <clears throat> there's an awful lot, we have an awful lot more data than this um, uh, and we could give you a, a report with, with other things if you, if you wanted to see that in, in future kind of data reports. Uh, but what I thought I'd do is just focus on a few of the, um, the slides that have got the graphs on because they show the trends over time and I think they're, they're, they're sort of the easiest to, to access. So the, the first one um, is on the third um, so, well, it's actually the fourth slide if you include the title one, um, which is the life expectancy at birth for males and life expectancy at birth for females. Um, so you can see over that last sort of 20-year period that we started off, uh, Greenwich is the lower line, the, the line underneath with the blue 
blue connecting line, and the England average is the black line above. Oh, you've got yellow and black. <laughs> so in both cases, Greenwich is the line underneath. And if you had it in color, you'd, you'd see that some of it's color coded red and some of it's color coded amber. Basically, what you can see over that time period is at our life expectancy for both men and women was significantly, statistically significantly below the England average, particularly for men 20 years ago. And we have closed that gap as life expectancy has increased across the country. It's increased faster in Greenwich for both men and women, um, which is a good thing. Uh, but, but what you'll also see is, uh, in, in, in the last few years, the, the increase in life expectancy, both nationally and in Greenwich, has plateaued. So we've started to see it flat, flatten rather than continue to increase. And in fact, in the last time period on here, you'll see a, a small dip downwards, uh, which I think is the start of the... Uh, of the, the impact of the pandemic in terms of the proportion of, of younger people who sadly um, lost their lives during that period. Um, and so there's, there's you know, significant concern about whether that trend continues in terms of the, the flatlining of, of life expectancy, um, because it tells us something about uh, the sort of stasis of the of the state of the of the population. Um, so the other one on that slide is the suicide rate. The Greenwich line is the one that's a bit more volatile, that goes up above and then comes back down. Generally, our, our rate has been has been lower and continues to be um, to be lower. Um, I'll take you two slides on. Uh, you've got the top left graph there, which is killed and seriously injured casualties on England's roads, and the Greenwich line is the is the top line there. So we have been consistently a little above the England average. Uh, and we know um, from the, the, the statistics that sit underneath that in terms of the fatalities that sadly um, uh, occur from time to time that uh, a, a reasonable proportion of those have been pedestrians. And then quite a few have been um, motorcyclists on some of our main arterial roads through the borough, particularly the A2. Um, so that, that, that picture of, of slightly of, of, of above the England average is, is pretty consistent with kind of inner, uh, inner, inner city um, areas. Uh, and then you've got the, on the right hand side, the cancer, percentage of cancers diagnosed at stages one and two, which is sort of early diagnosis, which uh, brings with it uh, the better chances of, of treatment being successful. So we really want cancers to be diagnosed as, as early as possible. Uh, and the Greenwich data there is tracking a little below the, um, the national, and we're, we're doing quite a bit of work on that. And in fact, it's in the health and wellbeing strategy is one of the things that we're, we're covering there. Um, a couple of slides on, uh, you can see os uh, admission episodes for alcohol-specific conditions. Uh, top left slide. The Greenwich is the lower line there, so our rate has been consistently, significantly below the England average. This is actually for under 18s, but our adults is the same. Um, so that's a, that's a, a sort of better news story. And on the top right hand side, smoking prevalence. Um, again, a downward trend nationally as as people um, quit smoking in bigger numbers and fewer people take up smoking. Uh, we have been sort of bouncing a, uh, up and down. Um, so again, the Greenwich line is the more volatile line there um, that, go, that at some point was above, but is currently a bit below the England average. Uh, and there was some very significant uh, announcements made last week uh, by the Prime Minister about additional uh, investment and priority being accorded to ta continuing to, to bear down on tobacco, which is really important. Um, I'll, um, I'll just click on a couple more slides of some child health uh, indicators here. Um, the top left one is smoking status at time of delivery. So again, the Greenwich line is the lower of the two lines. Um, Although it looks like we're doing well compared to the England average, actually we were one of the highest in, in London for the, the proportion of women who were still smoking at the time of giving birth. And we, we had a really big 
piece of work done with the hospital um, a year or so, a couple of years ago, and you can see that that resulted in a big drop um, in, the, in the latest time period, so we're, we're very pleased about that. Um, and then underneath that is the child obesity data for year six, so children leaving secondary school. Uh, and uh, in common with a number of London boroughs, though we are worse than most, uh, the, the Greenwich line is the one above the England line. So there is a small continuing upward trend in childhood obesity, and that is um, worse in Greenwich than it is in some other places. Um, uh, again, a couple of slides on, I won't cover the other smoking one, but on the top right, inequality in life expectancy at birth um, for males. So this is showing uh, what the gap is between uh, the most and the least disadvantaged groups in, within a uh, local authority area. So um, for, for men, you can see in the latest time period, it's round about six and a half years uh, uh, of life expectancy gap between men who live in the most deprived parts of Greenwich and men who live in the most well-off parts of Greenwich. That's actually a, a lower gap in, uh, in, 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 in terms of inequalities than the national, which is, which is at almost 10. So um, we know deprivation is the biggest predictor of, of poor health and early death, and that's a very stark picture there, but our, our, ours is slightly less um, than, uh, than nationally. And the females is the bottom left on that graph, and you can see the gap between um, Greenwich and the national is, is smaller, but the actual number is, is similar. It's, or it's still around about six years. Um, uh, to, I'll go um, to uh, four slides on to the winter mortality index. So the, uh, the slide that on the top left that, that shows the kind of uh, excess mortality that, that you see in Greenwich and in uh, England, and they're very, very similar, the picture that we've, that we've seen. Again, on, on the right, far right-hand side there, you'll see a COVID impact with a huge jump up in both cases. And actually, that's um, mirrored on the, the, the graph to the right-hand side of that, which is new sexually transmitted infection diagnoses, um, but in the opposite direction, where you see in that sort of first bit of the COVID period a, a drop in new diagnoses, uh, although we're now starting to see that increase again. Um, so I think that's, that's to do with, you know, the, the people not being able to mix as much um, whilst, whilst we were in lockdowns, etc. TB incidence, bottom left slide there. Uh, London has higher TB incidence than most other parts of the country. It's strongly associated with it being sort of imported from populations where they have, uh, they've either come from or have family that they go back and visit, family and friends that they go back and visit in countries where TB is more endemic than it is in, in this country. London's done a lot of work on, particularly on the treatment and treatment completion, which has br brought down the TB rates over, over the last uh, 10, 15 years consistently. So that's a really good, positive news story, but it is still an issue, and we do still have... Um, have cases. Um, yeah, so that's that's a sort of uh, run through some of the highlights and lowlights. Thank you very much. That was uh, very informative and very fascinating. Um, I'll open up to questions. Councillor Farhi. I spent most of the afternoon trying to analyse uh, <coughs> all of this information, um, which tends to... Um, caused me more confusion than uh, uh, enlightenment. So I'm hoping our discussions this evening may help to enlighten us a bit better in, in real terms. Um, in terms of the no trend data being available, uh, we, we, I think, do I get the impression that we're sitting here this evening uh, looking at some very important statistics um, that are slightly out of date um, so, when will the data become more relevant uh, in, in real terms? 
Um, and the, the point that struck me, uh, many did, but the two uh, of significance in my view were child poverty, uh, which seems to me to be in a, an astonishingly high figure. Uh, so how do we compare in terms of poverty with um, um, our, uh, our neighboring boroughs and beyond? And in terms of winter mortality, um, which I guess is down to a whole range of things, I probably um, we're not looking at statistics beyond, in some cases, the, um, the lockdown and, uh, and COVID. Um, so I suppose my, my overall question is really, uh, where do you think we are now um, and where do you think we need to be uh, in terms of resolving some of those important issues, which is not necessarily resting with um, um, the scrutiny panel or the council generally, but a wider debate uh, about how some of these issues can be um, improved and the lives of our communities um, can become better. I'd like to say, um, John, thank you for your question. I mean, the whole, um, we know that for Greenwich, health inequalities is a huge issue. And I think that's what you're pointing to, is health inequalities in our, in, in our, in our borough. And at the same time, there are huge pressures, not just in Greenwich, but, you know, structural things which aren't, which aren't really helping. I know part of the Greenwich plan, um, it talks about uh, health inequalities. And that's something that we are basically laser um, really treating it really, really importantly. And even in our recent discussions with the leader, um, and I know, I think Sammy, you might be helping us on, the, on in that work, in some of that work. We've actually pulled in Sammy to actually help us in that area. But um, and if you don't know, Sammy's going to be one of the um, cabinet assistants. And so we focused on that particular area. That's one area that we, we felt like we needed extra work in that area. So in terms of making it a priority, it's very much um, front and center of what we want to do. Um, because we do want to improve the lives for all residents here in our borough. So it is on our radar, very much so. Um, and everything that we do, whatever we, we look at, it, it's about that. But also in those data, um, there's suicide data. When if you look at that suicide data, it shows that we're doing better than the rest of the country. But for me, suicide is a preventable death, and it should be zero. And, and that's how we're looking at a lot of the data, is just bringing it down so that all residents benefit um, and their lives are improved. Um, I'll just hand over to uh, Steve. Yeah, so, the, so your first question was about the trend data. I mean, mo most of these graphs are trend data. There are a few where, they're, and they're nationally produced data, there are a few where they're, they're currently recalibrating how it's calculated, and so that's where some of the, some of the data is missing because we, it hasn't been kind of churned out yet, um, but, it, but it will be um, in time. Uh, and, and we've used the most up-to-date data that is available to us, so yes, some of it might not be bang up-to-date. Um, uh, but the, there's not there's not really too much we can do about that until until the the more recent data um, comes out. Um, and ch child poverty, yeah, it's it, it it's a, a huge issue. Features in in a lot of the missions in in our Greenwich in one way or another. Um, and um, uh, I, I think we will we would be in line with uh, really what Denise has just said, with, with, sim uh, with boroughs with similar levels of, of deprivation. Um, but obviously with the cost of living issues that we've got at the moment, uh, that's making matters worse um, rather than better. Uh, and, and the winter pressures, uh, the, the, the winter mortality um, issues, yes, it's, it's, it's complex. It's, it is, it's to do with, um, uh, things like cold cold homes it's to do with uh, higher prevalence of infectious diseases and people being indoors more in in the winter time 
um, it's, um, it's always it's always been there. Um, and, and you're right, um, Councillor Fahey, it will be it will be interesting to see the more more recent data um, since the um, since the the pandemic has kind of subsided somewhat. Uh, there's a lot of work underway uh, uh, to continue to encourage people who are more vulnerable to poorer outcomes in the winter time, particularly from COVID and flu, to get their vaccinations. Um, uh, so we're, we're, we're working hard, and the NHS in particular, to try and um, to encourage people, some of whom may, may be experiencing a bit of vaccine fatigue, having been invited to have COVID vaccine many, many times over the last few years. Um, but it's still around. It is still killing people. And uh, so flu always does every, every year. Uh, we just, um, we've just launched our uh, staff uh, flu vaccination program uh, at Birchmere and over in the Woolwich Centre. So I had mine yesterday. We're, we're offering it to all of our, our staff. Um, but, yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll come to you next time with a question myself. Um, the first one I want to talk about is the prevalence of smoking, uh, both in not necessarily in pregnancy, but within the population as a whole. As you pointed out, the line is very volatile compared to quite a steady decrease uh, within England. So my question is, why is that? Because um, you would expect if we're having successful intervention, then we know that that intervention works and we can repeat it and send the people would be going through um, with the, and mirroring that trend. So why are we so at odds with the national trend? It's, uh, it's artifactual. Um, it's to do with how the data is calculated. So basically it comes from an annual household survey where people are phoned up and asked about a whole load of different factors in their lives, including whether they smoke. And uh, that is sampled across the country. So every local authority will have a number of residents who are contacted, but it's not a huge number of residents. So it's not at an individual sort of local authority level hugely reliable, which is why it tends to kind of go up and down. The underlying trend is more is more um, relevant because it, it's a ballpark. It's a kind of ballpark figure for what's going on, and the national underlying trend. Um, uh, is, uh, is, is reliable because the, nationally the data set is a really big one. It's just a bit small at an at a individual borough level. So if that applies then, and the problem with this data set in its entirety across all of these is it's based on too small a sample size to really do trending, then, I mean, how, how useful is this? No, that's not, that's not the case at all. Um, that's the case in this particular example that you, you've asked about. But if you look at something like life expectancy, that's hard data based on the, the age of death of everybody in the borough. If you look at the suicide data, for example, or hospital admissions, um, those are those are, are, are reliable data. They're not, they're not about whether people have chosen to answer a question in a particular way or not. Okay, so I think, I think most of the data is, is, is more assured. Thank you. That's a good uh, answer. Um, my second question is around TB prevalence. So we know that TB is the most uh, deadly infectious disease globally, um, and that it's increasing um, globally. In fact, there's not quite a few um, drug-resistant strains of it which are now becoming dominant. Um, you know, I, it was a long time since I've been in school, but I we had the vaccination program of the the BCG. That's no longer happening. But how are we, our rates of younger children still getting the BCG? Is that how is that program still running? So yeah, um, areas that that are, are in um, higher prevalence. A popular, that have higher prevalence populations still do have the, the offer to, to babies, um, uh, which, which includes us, but it's not, it's not done as you, as you will remember at, at school days. But I, I, I repeat, it is, a, it is a really good news story because those, those numbers have come down hugely. Uh, and, and a lot of that is to do, so we have, a, we have in the borough something called a, a latent TB uh, testing program, which is where we invite people, particularly people who are 
uh, newer into the borough and who come from countries where the TB prevalence is higher to test for what's called latent TB, which is where you're not actually poorly, you don't necessarily know you've got it, but you have, um, you have actually got TB in your system and it can become reactivated at any point further down the line. And if we can find people with latent TB before they get infectious and before they get poorly, they can get treatment and it can be cleared from their systems. So that's one of the things that we've been doing across London that has really helped to, to bring the rate down, as well as really focus on what's called treatment completion. So for, the, for TB, it's really important that people follow the treatment regime, which is not a very nice one, and it's quite a long one. They have to follow it all the way through to the end to make sure that it's that it's effective. So, um, really uh, placing emphasis from from the treatment providers on supporting people to understand the importance of completing their treatment and to make sure that they do has has borne um, uh, positive results. Thank you. Yes, I know it's quite a high number of the population are latent TB carriers. Um, is there contact tracing if a case is within the borough of TB? Yeah, ab absolutely. So it's another area where our UK Health Security Agency start, uh, people are, are, are in the lead. So if there are, uh, it's a notifiable disease. If, there, if there's a, a, a case, uh, then they would, they would do the um, immediate sort of look around to see whether or not uh, a person may have presented a risk to, to others, which would normally be close co household contacts. It may in some cases be, um, you know, if you're a childcare worker, for example, and you work with young children and you're likely to have been in close contact with, uh, with people for protracted periods of time. Because uh, pe people think TB is, is very easy to catch. It's, a, it's actually not that easy to catch. You need to be very close to somebody for quite a long period of time in order to have put them at, at significant risk. Um, so, so they would do all of that kind of assessment. And we, we in, in the public health team do get involved in supporting some of that, that work um, where, where there's a significant risk. So we had one not, not terribly long ago in, which was in a, in a childcare setting that required quite a bit of screening, so we, we assisted with that. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Uh, Councillor Rahman. Thank you. I think a lot of my questions were actually answered. Um, I basically just wanted to ask about the data and the benchmarking of the data, really. So I understand we've got the kind of the national average versus um, the data set for Greenwich. So I guess I was just curious to know, um, are we, are we using the national average as a benchmark for when we're setting our strategies, um, or is, um, is that just more of a reflection of the kind of the research and the findings? Um, and also, just going back to what John was saying about kind of comparable data with kind of um, neighboring boroughs, um, especially around kind of infant mortality, and we'd be interested to know how we are doing as a borough as well. Yeah, no, that's a really that's a really fair um, question. So, what what this is is um, what used to be called Public Health England, that's now called the Office of um, Health uh, Improvement and Disparities, uh, had had historically produced every year a local authority public health profile, which uh, which used the the data that we've got here uh, to give a, a comparison between each local authority area and the national average. They haven't done it since COVID. Um, so we, we did our own version using exactly the same format just to kind of see where, 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 where that had got up to. But we can also do the kinds of, uh, of uh, comparator analyses that you're asking about. So with statistical neighbour boroughs, with South East London boroughs, with London as a whole, for all of this data. Um, and we do do that, and we do, we do have a look at that. Because we work as part of the ICS, quite a lot of the data is looking at how each of the boroughs compares with each other in, in South East London. But, um, you know, we, we've got um, a good data team, and if there are things that um, panel members would like to see in, you know, analysed in a different way, then we're, we're very happy to, um, to do that. And or, or we could do a, a report like this at a, at a future scrutiny that, that doesn't do the England comparison, but does a, 
a London or a South East London or a statistical neighbours. Um, so that might be something you might want to have a think about and we're, we're happy to do a sort of bespoke piece of work on that. Yeah, yeah, just on that, I think it will be interesting to see a comparative data based on London, because uh, London is a slightly different beast to the rest of the country, just, just because of the, the density of the population and the diversity as well, I think, makes a different challenge. Thank you. Any other questions on this item? No, well, thank you very much, um, Councillor Scott MacDonald and uh, Nick. Davis, uh, I believe Steve, you're staying for the next item, is that correct? Um, oh, sorry, I do say, pardon me, there is actually a question from a member of the public. Uh, if you would like to come up, there's a microphone just at the end here. If you could say what your name is, um, and if you're representing a group, and yes, I will take the second question afterwards. Apologies, panellists, I didn't see the hand. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. My name's John Kenny. I'm um, a member of the uh, Ferryview Patient Participation Group, but I'm attending here tonight as, a, as an individual. I'd like to uh, raise some supplementary questions to Councillor Fahi's questions about the Clover Health Centre. Uh, I will permit it, but it must be a question and not a statement. No, no, it's a question. Go uh, ahead. As a, a, there were some statements made by public health and others, that other practices, including mine, uh, were, uh, had capacity and uh, were willing to take on significant numbers of additional patients. Uh, I can clearly say tonight that the patient group and others and a senior partner at the practice extremely concerned at their ability to uh, recruit GPs that closure of Clover we lose GPs in the area um, and very concerned about the other services that Clover provided and I don't believe or I don't understand I'd like to hear tonight if we could they also uh, covered an, uh, quite a significant number of care homes which is obviously a council responsibility also to ensure that care homes are run specifically. So is your question regarding a response to capacity? Because I believe if we come on to our next item, that's really a question for our speaker, Neil Kennett-Brown, if he is willing to speak to that, to your concerns. I, I, I'm grateful. I just think if I could make some points, he might be able to respond to... to uh, I've only got a couple of other responses okay but you must if you could summarize just because i would want to move on uh, summarize it to your question absolutely uh, well to say that we had a uh, this was a i'm no i'm not a, uh, a patient at clover i know people who use clover and i know people who use services within that practice such as the copd service which which was a very uh, important service this woolwich is under some of the most severe pressure, healthcare pressures. And it seems, my question is how, at this particular time, can an area of such high levels of, uh, of need, including the, the Nepalese community, many of whom use this practice, but not only care homes, but also specialist services provided by this practice, and the, what appears to me this assumption or this statement that other practices were very happy to take up this additional capacity uh, appears to me to be questionable, at least. And, and Thank you. I will take that as your question. Point, I, I, must, I must say the response from the council tonight to John's inquiries was not to be to I be think. fair we we deferred uh, John, councillor Farhi's question to our next item because the main speaker on that yeah. is is in a better position to I answer appreciate that but the council has its own views too uh, well we, we will own. we will address it and in, during the next item it's Lovely. not been glossed over we deferred it to the next item can i say thank you very very much thank you did the other speaker wish to uh, public question okay Francis, 
Is it, what is it regarding? So is it on the data in this last presentation? Okay, please can you keep it to a question um, and I will stop you after two minutes. I'll just make one comment. Um, I've been to several meetings and um, isolation is often brought up. And what, you know, the only question is the council uses the internet a lot non-face-to-face -face in, so in the council when you want to see somebody or you've got to put a form in. So I just wondered whether we should relook at how we're communicating with everybody and should they have a choice? Because this comes up at every health meeting or local authority meeting I come to, isolation and, so and lack of socialising. Um, again, it's a clover. And... Um, in the, over the years, like everywhere else in London, the population has grown. Francis, I'm going to keep you to a question on Clover. Yeah, well, the question is, why are we closing GP practices? In 2018, we had 45. If Clover's sh shut, it's probably 28 now. So the population is growing, but the GP practices are closing, and therefore the ratio from 1,800 to 2,000 is well over. They don't do ratios now. And there is a problem. Why are they closing the, uh, all these practices? And merging is still closing because you lose the profit. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, I believe, Neil, you could speak to the particular issues that have happened at Clover. Okay, thank you very much, Francis. And just one more thing about health. Um, I started doing Nord Nordic, um, Nordic walking because of my spine, but apparently but there's, a lack of, there's, lack, there's a facility being shut by, by Greenwich Council, which are now given individually to the practices. Okay, can you put that as a question to the panel, yeah. and then we'll move on, because I, I, it's a questions from the members of the public. I do not wish to stop your story, but you appear to be going on to a story. So please. No, no, I'm just saying that, the, that now people have got to pay for this care. This, this health, which is quite different from walking, because Nordic walking affects the whole body and all sorts of uh, skeletal issues as well. So therefore, the council actually closed one down, if probably the economics of um, the budgets, but, it, but people now can only go if they pay so much money. So I'm, okay, I'm um, I do not know if any of the panellists are able to answer that one particularly, so I'm afraid I don't think it'd be fair to put it to them if it's not no. their area of expertise. Well, it's part of the council policy, it was after COVID. Okay, I don't think that there is any panellist here who will be able to answer that. If you are, if you wishing to email me this, I can make inquiries to your yeah. question, but I don't think it's fair to put it to the panel. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you to the panellists. Um, Steve, thank you for staying on. We'll move Grace swiftly to the next item. Okay, so we're moving on to item six, which is the Greenwich Health and Wellbeing Strategy Update, um, moving to the 23 to 28 period. And Neil Kennett Brown, I would much appreciate it if you were able to pick up on the points raised about the closure of Clover. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, for those who don't know me, I think everyone does. Um, Neil Kennett Brown, Chief Operating Officer for the ICB. As I understand it, we are presenting on the Health and Wellbeing Strategy. So I will do that first, and uh, then we can pick up other questions that came up in the first section um, of the meeting uh, around Clover, which again was an agenda item on the agenda. So I will do the, my best to answer those other questions. Yes, um, please proceed to the, the main item. Thank you. So um, we are going to take the health and wellbeing strategy as read. I just want to set a little bit of context. Um, historically, uh, every borough has to have a health and wellbeing board and every borough has to then have a health and wellbeing strategy. And what we've managed to do is join up the health and wellbeing strategy for the borough, which is also um, aligned with the South East London's integrated care systems 
uh, priorities which are agreed and Anthony Okere as the leader of the council sits on something called the South East London Integrated Care Partnership so that's the overall um, body and each of the six local authorities sits on it along with all the other NHS institutions and they agreed five key priorities um, and we basically took those five key priorities the R Greenwich corporate plan which came out of the kind of uh, which you as councillors will all be very familiar with um, and basically we've brought all of those together and we've got a five-year plan going forward which is an NHS requirement to have a five-year plan going forward a five-year forward view uh, document as well as it being the health and well-being strategy so hopefully it means our members of staff who have to feed the different parts of the system be they within the council within the NHS have one plan and one set of priorities that we all agree on and we'll work to together so that's what Steve and I are are going to talk through. I was told not to do a detailed run through of what everything is. So what I'm going to do is give some practical examples of each of those and Steve and I are going to do a double act on that. So um, it's actually really the last section of, of the strategy uh, document is basically our delivery plan for this current year. So I just want to, I'm just going to draw a few things out. So the first of those priorities is start well. The overall banner of live well, which you might be familiar with, and we have start well, be well, feel well, stay well, and age well. We didn't put on die well, but actually maybe we should be brave and say die well, but basically that's within our last um, uh, one of, of aging well, because it's one certainty that will happen to all of us. But in terms of starting well, the priority is children, young people get their best start in life and reach their full potential. And I just wanted to draw attention to one example of that is the Family Hubs uh, programme. Uh, a number of you may have already seen in Thamesmead, we opened one, our first Family Hub. I don't know if any of you were at that event. Um, that was in July. Quaggy um, opened uh, just this last month um, and uh, uh, Stanway opens in November. So these are really exciting uh, developments working alongside our children's uh, centres, but basically making sure that there's that parent-infant relationship, the per perinatal mental health support, home learning environment, and infant feeding support. So that, as an example, is a very practical thing that we're putting in place about children getting the best start in life and to reach their full, full uh, uh, potential. So I was just going to cover that one, and then I was going to hand over to Steve for uh, an example so for the next two. I'm doing the next three. So um, under Be Well, um, 1.2, uh, everyone is more active. So this is the section that's, uh, that's about physical activity. Uh, and as Neil said, the, the, uh, the, um, the activities, the, the things called high impact activities in these, uh, in these delivery plans are the kind of year, year one commitments. They're not everything that we intend to do. They're not everything that we need to do. So in a sense, there's some, some examples of, of significant pieces of work that will be underway during this first year of the strategy. So you can see under physical activity one, we're looking at some of the kind of environmental things to do with play streets, play estates, school streets, uh, uh, the kind of active travel agenda, trying to encourage and support people to move around the borough um, safely uh, through walking and cycling and, and public transport. Um, the second one's a more clinical one around a physical activity pathway, so looking at how our, um, our GPs and other uh, health and care providers support people into physical activity, both as a means of preventing poorer health outcomes, but also treating um, uh, uh, various conditions. Physical activity is, is one of the sort of silver bullets in public health that if we all did a little bit more would make a huge difference at a population level. Um, and then there's a, a strategic one, uh, the third one here, which is about uh, uh, reviewing and updating our Greenwich physical activity and sports strategy, which was a strategy that was published not terribly long before the pandemic hit. So it's one of those things that really needs um, dusting off and updating uh, because the world has changed since we first uh, put that together. So the next one, 1 1.3 under Be Well, is everyone can access nutritious food. Um, and again, there's a sort of clinical one around uh, the diet-related uh, disease care pathways and how we're supporting people with existing conditions effectively uh, around, around diet. 
Um, there's one specifically around the Food Poverty Action Plan uh, and the various strands of, of our Greenwich where, where um, uh, access to affordable, nutritious food is, is important uh, and it's a really critically important thing at the moment. Uh, and we know we're doing, we're doing a lot around, around the food agenda. Um, and then the third one is around looking more at the kind of environment uh, of, of our borough. So uh, how easy is it for people in different parts of the borough to access affordable, healthy food? What does, what does our market offer look like? Uh, how can we work with our fast food uh, outlets and other food outlets to support them to think about um, a healthier offer for, um, for, for residents? Um, so those... Those are the food and physical activity ones. The next one um, under Feel Well 1.4 is about fewer people who experience poor health as, re as a result of addiction or dependency. Um, and here we're talking pr primarily about tobacco, about drugs and alcohol, and about gambling. Uh, and um, you'll see uh, there's, a, there's a number of, uh, of initiatives underway there. Um, but um, one of the things that we're going to do to try and bring some of these things together is to develop an, an addiction strategy for the borough that actually looks at, uh, at tobacco, drugs and alcohol and, and gambling. Um, and particularly that third area, gambling, which actually does have a really significant impact on people's um, mental and ultimately physical health uh, and obviously on their finances. Um, is something that I think there's there's quite a lot of headroom for for more work to be done, and the NHS is getting into um, the space of providing um, more cl sort of clinical support and psychological support for people around uh, around the gambling um, issues. So I think it's you next, Neil. Mental health. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, so yes, yeah, so. Uh, Fewer children and young people affected by poor mental health. So again, this is one of the South East London wide uh, priorities. And what I wanted to talk about is the first of the sort of practical plans was about the development of iThrive. Now people might have heard of Thrive already to do with mental health. It's a, a kind of a frame uh, of work. But the, the iThrive model for children is very much a kind of preventative model for children's mental health and creating a single point of referral. Very often people think of a child, and I know this isn't the children's scrutiny panel, and just to say we did a very detailed presentation to the children's scrutiny panel um, around this, this particular area a few months ago. Um, and we got a range of providers to, to present there, so that would be available online to, to see. But one of the things that was, is really important in this model is often people think, my child has got special additional needs around child and adolescent mental health, they need to see the specialist services, was actually a lot of what people need is access to earlier help, but it isn't actually the specialist support that's needed. So we have a whole range of services, services that work in schools, services that work in the community with Charlton Athletic Community Trust, work with Young Greenwich. We also start right at the beginning of life with Mums Aid, which is a support around perinatal uh, uh, mental health and supporting uh, single mothers and, and others who are struggling with their mental health early in their, uh, in their sort of, in, in, in the life journey. So there's a whole range of services together. And the I Thrive model is about trying to make sure you get the early help, the preventative help, but when you need the specialist help, you get it. But, it's, but a lot of stuff can actually be done in that preventative space. So I just wanted to highlight that as, as an example in there. I can talk about the other aspects as well. Um, then the next area um, is around uh, fewer adults are affected by poor mental health. And I'm really delighted that we've now got our community mental health um, hub up and running um, at, at Plumstead. I don't know if any of you have been to the Plumstead Health Centre and seen the facility. Definitely would be happy to organise that for members of the scrutiny panel to, to look around. There's circa 50 staff. Um, we had a health and wellbeing board in, informal meeting um, about two weeks ago now, I think two or, two or three weeks ago, in the Kidbrook new uh, facility. And we were presenting around this. Um, and uh, um, it was a really sort of fantastic uh, opportunity to kind of talk about the service. It's not just delivered by Oxley's, our Community Mental Health Trust. You've got BLG Mind, so Bromley, uh, Lewisham Greenwich Mind. Uh, you've got Bridge Recovery Services, Bridge Support uh, as part of that, uh, working 
alongside Oxleys and the Royal Borough of Greenwich in an integrated model um, to support mental health. So I think there's almost 50 workers who work out of that hub to really deliver a, a much more comprehensive offer of mental health support. So I just wanted to kind of highlight that as the mental health example. Um, I hope this is helpful for you as a, a panel to kind of do this kind of touch in on, on examples. Um, the next one is around uh, uh, integrated community teams based in neighbourhoods providing the right support where they need. So this is in the sort of stay well uh, uh, one. Um, I think I might have jumped one, but I'll go back to the, the next one. But it, the, the real example of this neighbourhood working is really about working in a very different way and so we've done some really good work in areas like Glyndon as an example um, building partnerships with our local communities around uh, our care it's not necessarily linking just to primary care networks which are groups of GPs who work together but very much more focusing around the neighborhood as the community see them and getting cohesion uh, working together and you'll see a, a, a good example in there in the middle around the way we're commissioning our new public health uh, preventative services and we're trying to do that in a real co-productive uh, way um, and those new models of, of services will be up and running um, as we complete that process but that's very much working in partnership with Charlton Athletic, um, Greenwich Community uh, Development Agencies, the Lewisham and Greenwich Trust who deliver the sexual health services, Greenwich Health who are the federation who deliver the health checks uh, for the population, the Royal Borough of Greenwich's own public health team, Metro, because of the support they give um, to on the sexual health services with Oxleys. These, th there are many aspects and what we're trying to do is bring all of that together when we're commissioning services so that we can get a much better community model at a neighborhood level rather than historically they would have been potentially done in individual silos and then you wonder why these different organizations don't all work together because you commission them very differently so there's a real opportunity for that neighborhood working um, in terms of everyone getting access to services they need on an equitable uh, footing so there's a whole range of things we're trying to do to improve um, access around primary care access acute access and I particularly wanted to stress the work around the single integrated uh, urgent care so people might be aware that Greenwich Health the GP Federation so it's, it's an organization that's run by all of our local GPs um, won the contract so the previous provider Greenbrook who were the uh, incumbent provider for a whole number of years who are not local GPs um, didn't win that uh, bid and our local GPs did successfully win that. We designed the procurement process to support an integrated model. That's what we wanted. Obviously anyone could have bid for it and I'm really delighted to say that our local GPs have won that uh, service in order to mean that we can have the join up um, and some wonderful personal examples, not personal but practical individual examples was um, they're using uh, live well coaches as a pilot as part of that and that will continue now and what was really interesting is so someone comes into urgent treatment center they've got lots of need they go and be seen and they get discharged and what we had was in the department is we had people who would come in literally almost every day and definitely every week there were some individuals by when we put a live well coach in there they tried to find out what was going on and the department and the staff thought, has this person sadly passed away because they stopped coming? But what had happened was that the Live World coach had understand what the person's issues were, issues around isolation, which Francis was highlighting earlier, was able to put the right signposting in place, put the right services in place, and that person is no longer coming in to the emergency department on a regular basis. So these are examples, some of these things cross cut, but it's about changing the, the way we work together. But that new urgent care centre is a real good opportunity. We've, we've got a, an opportunity across South East London to recommission our 111 service, which people might be quite familiar with, um, um, over the course of the next few years. And there's an opportunity to further integrate the model so we get the right kind of responses for that. I'll hand back to Steve for the one on health inequalities. Nearly there. Um, so, so the 1.9 is, is also under stay well, um, and we're, we're looking here at some of the biggest um, contributors in terms of clinical outcomes to, to our health inequalities. Um, so th three schemes here, one is around um, supporting improvement in diabetes care, 
Uh, one is around uh, improving uh, screening uptake for cancers. Um, cancer is the uh, just tips cardiovascular disease as the biggest cause of, of death in our population. Um, and we've, we've been doing some really um, interesting work, uh, insight work, talking with our, our residents, but also very proactive work, trying to reach out to people who haven't taken up the screening offer when it's been, uh, when it's been given to them, to try to really have a, have a bit of a step change in, uh, in, uh, in improving access to an uptake of screening services. And then the third one is around cardiovascular um, inequalities, so heart attack, stroke in particular, uh, and looking at things that we can do um, in the short term, like um, some, some really innovative work to try and uh, uh, identify people with high blood pressure who haven't previously been diagnosed uh, uh, through this 100-day challenge methodology. And we're also doing some work at sort of much more upstream with children and families around improving physical activity levels. So back to Neil for the last couple. Thank you. And um, yeah, the last one, which is age well. Um, and just to give an example of that is our home first work. So people might not be familiar with the framing of home first, but essentially it's about supporting people individually in the community. And you would have heard Nick earlier talking about a lot of the adult social care uh, development work. What we've been trying to do as an example is, is expanding the support for people at home around something called a virtual ward, which basically make, means people don't need to be into a hospital bed um, and taking up space in the hospital, but they also don't need to be there because actually there are higher risks of infection and actually people tend to recover and improve their healthcare far better at, at home rather than being in a, in a large kind of hospital setting. So the the expansion of our uh, virtual ward work um, has been quite significant. So we've got 179 people who can be simultaneously supported in our virtual ward uh, models. Um, we had a 50% reduction in the first six months of that work when we piloted it in one of our um, areas in Greenwich. So by basically working in a multidisciplinary way with a group of uh, frail people, working in com combination with the, the GP practices and the geriatricians in the hospital to work in a multidisciplinary way to support those people working with our community uh, team together. So that's the kind of with Oxley's, the, the, the joint emergency team who do the kind of rapid response uh, services as well as uh, with the community uh, services. So they're examples of some of the practical things we are doing to make what might feel like quite a high level strategy real. And I think Steve and I would be very happy to take any questions you have. Thank you for bearing with us. Uh, thank you very much on that. Um, members? Councillor Bakken. Um, thanks very much for your report. It was really nice to hear practical examples. So um, thank you and I appreciate it. It's not easy given um, current climate. Um, my question's about um, 1.7. Um, particularly about primary care access improvement and it you know because it's to do with healthcare the most kind of common one of the most common interactions with patients is about problems getting through to their GP accessing appointments getting face-to-face -face appointments um, and um, I one of the high impact activities um, established baseline position for patient experience of contacts, ease of access and demand management. But I would think already we are aware of the baseline position or where we're at now. I mean, we've got friends and family surveys. We've got, you know, I think even been presented at this panel data with how patients feel about accessing their GP surgeries. So it would just be good to hear one, do we not already have that metric? And then also implement activities contained within the access recovery plan. I'm sure that's a really complex plan, but it would just be good to hear some of the practical steps in terms of getting, helping patients have better access to primary care. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so we came and presented at the scrutiny committee about a year ago, all around primary care access and did a whole kind of explanation on that. And I'm more than happy that we come back and do that with, with more detail um, on that if you'd like an update on it. There has been this kind of national access recovery plan. Um, so a number of the initiatives are, some of them might sound kind of mundane, which is around uh, 
uh, cloud te telephony, but basically making sure the phone system is more effective because actually one of the big challenges for people is they complain about is they can't get through on the phone. That's partly because the, 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 the systems and the software they're set up are not in the best way to do that. So making sure that there's those kind of practical systems, website accesses, working well. Another key aspect is workforce. So it's making sure you have the right workforce. So it's just anticipated or um, felt that there's about 30% of all the work that goes into a GP practice genuinely needs to see a GP with their clinical skill set. There's another 30% of the work that needs to see a clinician and have an appropriate support. And what we've been trying to do is expand the workforce, and I'll talk about that. And there's another third, which actually don't need to see necessarily either of those two things, but sometimes are people's apprehension. There is a few things that there that can be resolved relatively straightforwardly, but around, you know, people need to go, you know, need a GP's letter for something, but it's not necessarily because they really need to see the GP. It's kind of an administrative task. But there are also things where people may be depressed or isolated or, or, or other things where actually the live well coaches that we have working in our practices can help do that. So we've, we've, that if, you, if you think of that as the model around primary care access, one of the key things we're trying to do is obviously strengthen the number of GPs we have. We've got 47 GPs in training at the moment in the borough. So we've got Dr. Eugenia Lee, it'd be brilliant to bring her here and she can talk all about the work we're doing to, to grow the GP workforce for the future. And we're really, you know, lucky to have someone as, as good as her who runs the GP uh, training program um, in the borough. But what we're also doing is we're expanding our what's known as additional roles and responsibilities uh, roles, which are, GP, are, are other roles that work in GP practices. So we've got over 33 pharmacists now working in our GP practices. I don't know if any of you have had you know, a primary care appointment, but you may well have had appointments with a pharmacist who's been reviewing your medication, um, and, and, and making decisions on that. Um, you've also got roles around, uh, you have some physios, first contact practitioner physios, um, you've got uh, physician associates, and there are many other examples of roles, additional roles that are working in GP practices to support uh, the overall uh, working of a, of a GP practice. So they're just two examples of what we're doing, the workforce aspect, as well as the sort of the practical aspects around um, kind of telephony and things like that. But each practice has an improvement plan and we are working with those practices uh, to do that. Thank you. Um, that's really, really helpful. I don't know. I know, as Steve said, it's something you can present to the panel back, but it's something that the panel could kind of keep an eye on. If there was a specific metric about like the amount of times I hear I just couldn't get through on the phone. Um, and, you know, people say about, the, you know, the services I work in as well within, within secondary care. But I don't know if there's a way in which the panel can almost keep track of that metric to see if this is improving. Maybe I'll have a think and then can email you. I do. We, um, we did bring primary care access last year on the agenda. We don't have it in our current work plan, but that's not to say that it shouldn't be there at a future meeting. Um, we'd have to find out where it could possibly go, but it's something that obviously is a continuing concern for residents and thus should be scrutinized. Um, Councillor Fahey. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you both for um, uh, your comments on the report. <coughs> Uh, I have a couple of points to make, Chair, and then perhaps a, a number of questions, if I might. Um, it's obviously a very ambitious program. Uh, it's full of uh, good and laudable things. Um, but I see nothing in the report uh, about either finances or resources. So collectively, how is that going to be achieved? I mean, uh, those of us sitting in this room looking at budgets uh, cannot understand what's likely to be the budget situation next week rather than uh, in uh, 2028. So is each of the elements of the report uh, costed, um, measured, uh, and likely to be delivered within the, uh, within the program? There's some very laudable things, as I say, in it. Uh, the other point I want to say in, in, in my observations, the key issue for me um, representing the community as all of us do around this um, room 
is how is it possible uh, for patients in the 21st century uh, to get an appointment with a doctor when they need it? And clearly, the system currently is not working. I don't know if any of you have had the experience of sitting on a, on a call at um, two minutes past eight in the mornings, um, and the first thing you hear, um, if, you, um, if you need the um, uh, 999 dial, you know, dial somewhere else, you know, it gives, gives you a whole lengthy issue and all of that. And what's happening effectively, and let's be honest about it, is that people in the GP surgeries are making decisions about whether you get an appointment for a doctor or not on the basis of information uh, and knowledge that they don't have as a GP. And as a consequence, people are suffering. And in addition, they are going to uh, A&E services because they are uncertain about their lives. And what's changed between what was happening pre-COVID and happening now simply because the bureaucracy believes uh, that uh, what can be achieved now is a new way of doing things. But in effect, if we're talking about health and well-being, the starting point must be about making sure that a GP or some health provider recognises their needs. So um, I think GP services is an issue uh, that we need to return to at a later date. So therefore, my questions are, um, in terms of nu nutritional food, excellent, but there's nothing in, and we had a report earlier on uh, about the question of um, uh, poverty. There's nothing in this report that I see uh, about free school meals. There's nothing in this report uh, about free breakfasts uh, for young children. So if we're talking about health and well-being, surely there are starting points. So the other uh, questions I have, how does one achieve in each ward um, a family hub and what is the criteria? Uh, so therefore, are the family hubs going to be, uh, is there a model uh, and a criteria for family hubs? And will there be one uh, in each ward, I guess not. And the um, other point I wanted to raise is uh, in relation to um, the um, health and well-being and the the issues around uh, ensuring that all the people have all the fitness and all of that that they need. And I think what is required, I think, in, from that point of view. Um, is an understanding as how this agenda uh, will, the messages will become loud and clear to people. Because I guess we have this report, but there needs to be a mechanism of informing people that these are the services that exist across the borough. This is where you need to get them. So uh, within all of this strategy, in my view, there needs to be uh, a significant uh, communication strategy uh, and I think lots of people um, would be very interested in all this being offered. But I think the question uh, remains in my mind uh, is, um, will the money follow uh, the uh, offer? Shall we, shall we have a go at the, the, those various questions? I'll, I'll, I'll kick off, Neil, and then you can um, you can complete. Um, in terms of the, the resources that are available, um, in, in some cases there are additional resources. So the Family Hubs brings additional resources. Um, some of the drugs work that we do, we've had significant new investment for, for that. Um, the smoking announcement last week, uh, there's money both for treat tobacco treatment services but also for enforcement around things like illegal sales to underage children. Um, and there'll be more around trying to, to, to bear down on the issue of vaping amongst children, um, children taking up vaping and, not, and it's not as a, as a smoking cessation aid. 
um, which, is a, which is a problem. So there are some pockets of additional resources. A lot of what we're trying to do as partners is to say, how can we, um, how can we make the, uh, the biggest contribution as you know, large organizations, as employers, uh, and also as the people who are in contact in, in front line with, with residents on these priorities. And some of that's about changing the way that people do their work. Your point about communications and making sure that, that everybody knows about the sources of information about services and things that are available, the Live, the Live Well program, the Greenwich Community Directory, Francis's point about there being other media than just online um, to, to achieve that. Um, so I think that's, that's, you're absolutely right, um, Councillor Fahey, the, the communications challenge is a, is a really, really big one. Um, so, I, so I think on, on the resources, um, we, so there's the sort of changing the way that we do things, bringing all of our um, services to bear on these priorities, using some of the new money and seeking some additional new money as well, which I think we're quite good at. Um, in, in Greenwich. A um, couple of the other um, questions that you, you asked. So the food stuff, that obviously there's this work on free school meals happening, there's the, um, the holiday activity and fun program, there's the, um, the, you know, the holiday food program, there's a, there's a lot in the, um, in, in the food um, uh, agenda and the food poverty agenda and um, chair I, I think I don't know whether you were at the last overview and scrutiny committee but there was a, a presentation there that included a lot more detail around the, the the food agenda and food poverty agenda so we can certainly share more on that if you if you'd like to to get more detail um, and, I, and I'll probably leave Neil to comment on the on the family hub program and and obviously the primary care access Thank you. Um, yeah, so the Family Hub program is a national uh, initiative that got launched in 2022. I don't know if you've been to any of the, the, the ones that are running already. Um, interestingly, it often uses the phrase Sure Start, and people might, be, might have remembered Sure Start from the past. So Greenwich is quite unique in having, I think, 23 children's centres still. There are many other boroughs that have one or two now, which used to have many more. So we're in a position where we... We, you could argue we have a family hub type of model already in place because of the children's centres. Um, but what we've done with the additional funding is focus on four family hubs across the borough in our areas of highest need uh, and making sure that that's, that's in there. And it's a hub and spoke model. So the, the spokes are some of the children's centres that aren't actually nominated the family hub, but making sure that they can still access all of those services and work work effectively together and I'm more than happy to, to expand that. It might be more appropriate for that to be picked up through the Children's Scrutiny uh, Committee, um, but Dave Borland, um, the Integrated Commissioning Director for Children, could definitely uh, talk that through. Um, and there's a national kind of criteria you have to go through and I can share the link um, uh, from that. Um, just to build on the point around communication, on, on the uh, slide that did talk about primary care access at the top around primary care access improvement at the bottom it talked about development of a Greenwich deal and part of that is about our communication offer with our population about how do we work with our residents differently to understand the health and care offer and um, so that there's that communication and that's something we are actively thinking about how we do um, and it also links into the um, peer review that the council had recently and the work around communications and engagement. So there's lots of opportunities to say, how do we engage more effectively with our, our population working together to co-produce uh, our, our solutions? In terms of the specifics um, around uh, primary care access, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of repeat, I, you, you, you raise important points. What I'd say is actually a lot of people do have success in primary care access and I'm it's not sorry I, I, I think we there's a there's a lot of um, anecdote where and I know there are problems I am not saying there are not problems that there are and it's an important area which is why it's a national priority and it's a regional priority and it's a Greenwich priority and it's something we're, we're saying we are working on I'm more than happy to work it through but a lot of people do get good access and I know not everyone um, uses 
uh, the phone as the way to go through. Some people go by physically going into the practices and some people use the online tool and there are also a number of apps that have been developed. Some of those are really successful for some people and they find that incredibly helpful. They can see the results that come through um, and, 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 and action things, request uh, new re, re, you know, renewal of their prescriptions and things like that can all be done kind of relatively quickly um, and, and very effective. So there are many different aspects to primary care access and making sure that those different services are, are put in place. In terms of your point around people making inappropriate decisions about what someone's actual need is, one of the uh, principles around something called e-consult, which has been used in quite a few places, is an online triaging system, because that helps identify what the need is. So one of the biggest challenges in all healthcare is what is someone's actual need, what they perceive as their need, and their level of urgency and clinical criticality, and I, I don't know where, where um, Councillor Bacton, where in the secondary care system you work, but understanding clinically what someone's actual need is and what those priorities are is a really important part of any clinical decision process and making sure that triage process is in, in place so that you can then identify what is the urgent need and what is the important need and making sure the right support is there. One of the things we're trying to do with the primary care model is for those people who have episodic care so they don't, they just haven't, you know, someone like myself probably doesn't go to a GP that often but when I do I, want, I don't particularly mind which I see. I don't have a particularly need to have a relationship with them in terms of an ongoing relationship. Um, they give me the advice, I get the thing resolved. Whereas if I've got a long-term condition, I've got a quite a complex, many comorbidities, that kind of person, you want to have continuity of care because the person knows them well, knows all the background, knows all the, that complicated history. And part of the way that um, we are working with our GP practices is around trying to differentiate the work so that you can get the continuity for some, but for the people who don't need the continuity and it's just a quick one-off, uh, quick advice uh, and resolution, they can get that. And so they're, they're all part of the process of that modernizing, transforming primary care um, access. Thank you, may I ask a question? Go ahead. Briefly. One of the issues I think that needs to be addressed, and thank you so much for the, uh, for the comments you've just made, is that the service, the NHS needs to recognize that for the vast majority of people don't have access to uh, an iPad or an iPhone uh, and are whistling in the dark in relation to what they can do. Most people, in some cases, have a choice between either have a phone uh, or switch on the lights. And I, I just think that there isn't, uh, I mean, I, I love the NHS app. I mean, it's fantastic uh, and quite useful. Got a few hiccups, but that's not the matter. But I just think people need to engage with those who can ill afford to have and meet the aspirations that GPs have, that people can do everything online because they can't. Yeah, I mean, I think we're working closely with uh, Kit Collingwood uh, around kind of digital exclusion because um, it's really important that we work together around digital exclusion because there are increasingly for many many services including those run through the council the expectation is people are, have access to the internet they have a smartphone um, and for, for those who do it works really well and then there are some people who are digitally excluded and that's why there's a whole process within the council which we work with in the NHS around digital inclusion. Um, I think it is something that we will have to be mindful of because it, we, what we need to make sure is not everything is dependent on, on the digital uh, front door only but it does have huge benefits. So what we don't want to do is lose those opportunities but we do need to make sure that the other channels of communication and engagement are available. And as far as I'm aware, all uh, practices and others have that flexibility of the different channels. Um, but where possible, you, you're probably trying to advise people to do things in the way that's gonna give them the best um, outcome for them in terms of access. But that's something we're having to work with 
I think, across our society, aren't we, at the moment? And I agree that some of the challenges around poverty and the cost of, 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 of things is, is a real um, challenge for, a, for the whole system. Um, and we have to try and sort of design that in the right way. At the same time, there's a lot of inefficiency with non-digital. At the moment, I don't know how many people get much mail through the post, but people often don't get letters. But when you exchange, when you engage with the NHS, you often do get letters because you have to, because it's one of the rules is we have to write people letters and they get letters in the post. But actually, there's a, there's a natural question of that every letter that's sent is the cost of the postage. Yeah. So it's just a question about how do we change things so that we give the appropriate, um, so that people who, who genuinely need the letter through the door get the letter through the door, but those who, who, who would be very happy to have it on an email and get it quicker would do that. And I think they're part of the challenges that we have as a society is working those things through. Thank you. I might take a question myself and then I'll come to you, uh, Councillor uh, St. Matthew Daniel. Um, my question on this as a strategy, my first thoughts are, where are the metrics and the KPIs? Um, and what are the monitoring and evaluation points of this strategy going forward? Because, um, as you can probably tell when we met, um, I mean, there's very laudable things in the strategy, but I kind of think the actual most important part is this appendix with what you're actually going to do. And some of the metrics here are sort of, you know, I'm looking particularly at 1.3 around the food plan. And some of the ways we're measuring this is just like numbers of users of Greenwich Food Bank, numbers of users of Food Club. Um, and on the next page, increase in referrals to quit and tobacco treatment. I mean, that's, for me, that's, um, that's not a metric that can be measured. I mean, how many, what, where are we starting? What percentage of the population are using food banks? And what do we want it to be at the end of this strategy? Um, so, you know, in some ways, I think it's, it's you know, the vision is there, but it's not a, vi a strategy is not just a vision. And I kind of find this, I, I kind of found it a very bit disappointing to read because it seems like there's no actual punch or points that we can say, are we achieving this? What are we actually trying to achieve in each of these areas? It's all very vague. Um, so that's that's my question because I, I can't see the metrics and I can't see the KPIs and I don't know where we're reviewing this throughout the next um, few years. So I'm happy to, 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 to start that. So I would actually, on the metrics, I'd encourage you to go higher up in the document than the, the detailed appendix because this is how we're tracking the delivery of those specific actions that we're saying in this year. But higher up in that, we've got, we, we set out the ambition against all of the against all of the overall vision statements, the five visions, the ten vision statements for each, about what we're trying to uh, to do and we we track. In terms of the way we're doing this, the Healthy Greenwich Partnership is the, the the group that basically sits underneath the Health and Wellbeing Board, which makes stuff happen, which is which have got the all the partners across the health and care system uh, around the table. And um, there are subgroups. Uh, underneath that for delivering things like the mental health oversight group works on the mental health aspects of that. Um, we've got a group that oversees the child and adolescent mental health work. We've got Home First Steering Group, which oversees all of the Age Well um, initiatives on this. There are groups that oversee um, the delivery around the healthy weight um, and healthy food um, aspects. So there are, there are subgroups Beneath this, the Children and Young People's Partnership Board, which is a, also a formal part which Anthony Akere chairs, that group particularly picks up some of the sort of child-related um, actions on here. So there's a cr cross-cut there between the Health and Wellbeing Board and also the Children and Young People's Partnership Board. So in terms of from a governance point of view, it's through those groups. Um, we, as the Healthy Greenwich Partnership, will be tracking every six months the delivery against our action plan and what, where we're up to. Obviously, this plan got signed off in July, so we're still at the early part of this process, but we will be able to provide updates against our progress uh, against this. I think your question on the metrics, what we really want to focus on is the overall outcomes we're trying to achieve for our population. And so and I recognize that some of the partnership metrics that are in the, um, the delivery plan section are about things like, you know, have you opened a, a family hub? Well, that's great. It's really good that you do. But what's important is what's the outcome as a result of opening the family hub and is it making a difference to uh, the children and those families and so those metrics are more contained it higher up in 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 the agenda um, so hopefully that helps explain um, 
a bit about the, the metrics and the tracking system and how we are, are will be reporting and more than happy in future meetings to come back and give an update on how we're doing against against this work. So just to follow up on that, when you say look higher up in the report, are you referring to the sections where you outline the main articles, though, say overview of the plan, so section six of the report? Because I'm not sure I agree with that because, I mean, you look at what we plan, where we plan to be in 2028, I'm looking at page 88, uh, more people will access help to give up smoking. Healthy life expectancy measures will improve. I still don't see metrics there. I still don't see, I see, what, I see very bold statements about what uh, um, a, a vague outcome. Yes, we all want these things to be achieved. I don't see here any mechanism for which it w would form a strategy for getting there. So I, I don't, and I'm not sure I quite see your answer. Uh, to that last so question. Maybe I, maybe I can add, um, I mean, as Neil said, this is sort of fairly recently agreed, so some of, the, some of the more granular work on metrics hasn't been completed, and also some of the actions uh, that we'll be taking are not all year one actions, so, so the, the metrics related to those wouldn't, wouldn't sit in this delivery plan. Something like tobacco, so there is a, um, there is a, a, a target of having uh, a five percent or less smoking prevalence for for London in tw by 2030, which is a slightly longer timeline than this. We know how we know from our from our prevalence uh, broadly how many smokers we currently have, and we can and I've done the maths to to, to show how many fewer smokers we will need to have by 2030 in order to achieve that five percent prevalence or less. Um, uh, and we, we have um, a, a range of uh, things in place and programs that are developing that, that we believe will help us to get there. So I suppose what Neil is saying is don't, don't expect that everything that, that will give us some sort of, sort of meaningful indication of outcomes is, is going to sit here. It's, 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 it's sitting in some of those more detailed working groups. We can provide it, and some of it still needs to be worked up because it's a work in progress. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely, you're, you're absolutely right with your, with your challenge, Chair. We do, we do need to be clear about what, what good looks like and how we, how we will know whether we've achieved it or not. Um, but, but, but some of that's work in progress and some of that is kind of sitting in, in, other, in other places. This would have been a very, very long and less accessible strategy, I think, if we'd got into, into huge detail on that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sir Matthew Daniel? No, I mean, um, carrying on from what you've just said, um, Rachel, would it, be, would it be part of the going forward to have an agenda to review the topics every six months? And is that what you were planning that we do, or is that? So, so it's our, our plan as the Healthy Greenwich Partnership, which is kind of the officer group across the whole health and care system, is we will do that and we will track that. And I'm more than happy that we can give updates back here to the scrutiny panel uh, about what we're doing. We will also be giving updates to the Health and Wellbeing Board, which own the strategy. So this, this group could have scrutiny of that, but our updates will be going to the Health and Wellbeing Board as, as, as part of the kind of normal kind of governance for doing that so it's making sure we we progress this work I think I just wanted to sort of stress I know quite a lot of the questions have been very specifically on primary care and things like that this is about us getting and I think it is genuinely a good a, a good piece of work which is to get health and care organizations across the borough that work in off lots of different parts to agree a common set of priorities that we want to work on together for the next five years got 10 priorities by being aligned with the South East London's integrated care system it means in terms of Councillor Fahey's point about finance that means that they are the things that they've said strategically are the priorities for, for South East London so if there are more monies coming we are our strategy is aligned with the areas that will get resources and it's aligned with our Greenwich corporate strategy which is obviously where the council as well have said from its manifesto, this is what we want to do and aligning its resources. So I think 
I don't want us to lose the benefit of what we have got here, which is an overall health and care strategy for the borough that everyone's agreed on our strategic direction. We've got the political, clinical, organisational alignment for doing, which means we give our staff a chance for success in these important areas. We will be refreshing our delivery plan each year. So this is just the first one that Steve and I gave some examples of. Yes, we've got more work to do on things like the metrics, but in July we got that signed off and I'm, I'm pleased that we are at that point. Um, and I would suggest you know, we can come back and do scrutinise us on, on our progress against those overall um, objectives. Obviously, the world is a changing place as well, I think, as Councillor Fahi uh, indicated. And, you know, we know there will be a, an election in the next year. We don't know what the outcome of that will be, but we know there's likely to be changes uh, to the health and care system as a, as a result of that. And it's important that we say, well, these are our strategic objectives. And I don't think our strategic objectives overall will need to change because it's a comprehensive life course approach. But what we meet, may have is different delivery vehicles and things like that coming that will change how we do some of this stuff. And that's where we all need to adapt and work with uh, the Health and Wellbeing Board that owns the strategy as well as um, happy to take updates and, and come through to the scrutiny committee and be open about what those uh, challenges are. Thank you. Um, would I perhaps give you, given that we are starting pressed for time, um, and I have seen no other members wishing to indicate on this item, could I perhaps give you no more than two minutes to answer the questions around Clover? Certainly. I obviously, I wasn't here for the first part of the, the, the item, so I'll, I'll, I'll pick up the, the overall uh, points that I, I heard when I came into the room. Um, so the Clover GP practice um, uh, is, is now closed um, and closed at the end of uh, September. Um, it was a practice that was run uh, by a private organisation known as Mauling Health that runs a number of walk-in centres uh, across the country um, and uh, not not by local GPs but by uh, an overall uh, uh, kind of national uh, organization people like Virgin Healthcare and others can run these kind of services and it was under a particular form of contract known as an alternative primary medical services contract which basically means these are contracts that don't most GP practices I have contracts for in absolute per perpetuity. These contracts, these particular contracts, and the reason this one had was it was originally walk-in centre in 2008, meant it had to go it has to go out to re-procurement every uh, so so many years. And basically, the contract automatically came to an end at the end of September. The decision that was made was not to renew the contract. We did have an option to renew the contract, but we had some quite significant concerns around the contract and we decided that it was a our, our options were not to extend so that's the first decision we took which was not to extend um, it supported 5,400 uh, registered patients uh, one of our smallest our third smallest practice in Greenwich um, and it also supported our care home residents who obviously are a really important uh, group of people um, and basically what we've managed to um, achieve through this uh, change process is we have got all of our care homes are still being supported by a single practice. Uh, Greenwich Peninsula uh, practice is supporting all of our care homes so we've got that and they're working in partnership with Oxley's NHS Trust in delivering an integrated model to improve that and our care homes that the Royal Borough of Greenwich Commission um, and the team there are all working together on an improved model and we're starting to already see um, improvements for our, our care homes um, in, in the borough, which is important and that will be work that will um, further continue. In terms of the actual 5,400 uh, patients that were registered at the practice, uh, a dispersal process was undertaken and the reason we ended up doing a dispersal was because the value of that contract was not attractive for other providers to come into the area. So it's recommended that practice needs to be at least 10,000 for there to be, um, for it to be financially viable for others to come in and want to run uh, that practice. So we had an option which was to go through a procurement process that would have taken a long period of time, a lot of uh, money associated with it, and we didn't think we would get a high quality bid as a result of that. So we took the decision to disperse uh, the contract. 
the, um, the money associated with those patients, basically the money follows the patient. So if, the, if a patient registers at Ferryview or at Treveny or any other GP practice in the borough, for every patient that joins, that receiving practice gets the money associated with them, which allows them to recruit the staffing and the support uh, for that. Um, we did, in terms of the question specifically um, uh, about uh, Ferryview and capacity, so uh, Ferryview's actually got 80 uh, staff um, running it. It has now over a 30,000 patient list, so it's a very large uh, practice, and they did write to us and confirm that they had capacity and they were willing uh, to support uh, uh, taking on a number of patients, as did Trevini, which is another practice that's very near uh, Clover. Um, and we had a number of practices express that they did have capacity and were willing to take them on. They knew that then they would receive the money associated with those patients as they register with them. Um, I'm pleased to say, in terms of the staff, as I understand it, the Clover staff, um, all of them have secured new roles apart from two roles. So they've They've, they've done that. I think two people retired, two people didn't secure a job, but everyone else has secured roles, um, which is good from a kind of employment point of view. All of the uh, patients, as I said, in care homes are there. Um, I think there was a comment, I wasn't here, but I understand that about, there were 2,000 people who hadn't been registered, but Everyone, so the process is everyone is actually with a GP practice. So what happens in the dispersal process, I'll explain it very quickly, but essentially people got a letter um, to explain your practice is closing, there's an option for you to choose a practice. Um, they were written to both in English, but also if their first language was another language, they were written in that language as well, because we knew that there were some Nepalese populations there. We also put in place um, people from Health Watch physically in the practice, uh, a day a week to support patients um, on the process. We also, um, particularly for people with a learning disability, we did work with um, advocacy in Greenwich to ensure that there was support for those individuals and make sure that they were uh, safely uh, transferred uh, to another practice. And then if people hadn't responded to the first letter, there was a second letter that went out um, as, as a further reminder. And then a third letter went out for people to say, if you still haven't registered at this point in time, then we are allocating you to your nearest GP practice to where people lived. Now, the history of Clover is that a number of people were lived all over the borough. Normally, people all live pretty near, within five, ten minutes walk of a GP practice, but when you look at the picture of the footprint, people were registered in many different parts um, of the borough. So what we were doing is we were allocating them to their local GP practice. That doesn't mean that's the one they have to go to, but it is the one that we're allocating them to. And basically that's where their record uh, would go and they're encouraged then to go there, but they can still choose to go to another, pl uh, another place. Um, and there was less than 2000 at that stage um, in the process. We know that there are a number of people in every GP practice who may be not actually in this country or who may have moved to another part of this country or they may actually be abroad but they are still technically registered with that practice. So that's sometimes the group of people that you get towards the end of these processes. Just to say, Treveny practice as well acts as a caretaker. So this is a safeguard process to ensure that if someone, say, doesn't go to GP practice at all, but does go to A&E, and there are results that come back from the GP and there are actions to be followed, then that GP practice is gets those actions to make sure that those things are followed through if that person, to make sure that people are safeguarded um, in that uh, approach. Okay, thank you very much, Neil. Um, do any members of the panel wish to have any follow-up on this item? No, in which case I would thank you very much. Um, we did have another request for a member of the public, so um, please do come from the front. Can you please tell me what your question's regarding and who you're directing it to? Being strategy. Yeah, okay, but please remember we uh, keep it to question. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Neil Robertson. Uh, I'm here as uh, an independent, but 
most of you know that I'm the chair of uh, the coordinator of Greenwich Cyclists. Um, from uh, one of Neil's first comments was health lobbying, which I found interesting. Um, but um, Steve Whiteman, when he went through the graphs, um, didn't actually identify two of the graphs, which to me I see as the most important. So physically active adults, and we know that about 60% of our adults are not physically active, so they're not achieving the 150 minutes of uh, moderately intensive activity a week. And the other one that you didn't... Uh, uh, mention was the overweight or obese figure, which is another one of 60% of people are obese and overweight. And the real great thing about what I'm hearing today is a lot of it is not about sickness, a lot of it is about prevention, because the thing we need to do is prevent, and then we avoid the on-costs of all the medical interventions. So how much of your health lobbying is going to be to get, because you've already got active travel listed as one of the things you want to do, to get our streets safe out there. Lobbying the council to say, we want our streets safe for people to get out there and be able to walk and cycle as a norm, because that's the way to get your weekly activity built into your normal week. Okay, thank you for the question. Thank you. So I, I completely agree with you. I think, I think um, there's... Sorry, there's, just Steve, um, would you mind popping your microphone off? There's, um, there's, there's nothing really more important for public health than how physically active we, we, we all are as children and as adults and as older adults. Um, my annual public health report this year is on physical activity. I don't, I don't know whether you've seen it. I can send, send it to you if you'd like to see it. Um, and um, we've been taking that, I've been taking that around to various different places, including public forums and talking with people about the importance of physical activity. Um, cycling um, and walking safely is absolutely critical. Uh, I was at a meeting with all of the directors and the chief exec yesterday, taking them through the annual public health report and talking about all of the different ways in which the council directorates um, uh, so including transport and, and parking and planning and regeneration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and thinking we were talking about updating and refreshing the council's own travel plan to support staff to, to use active travel um, more effectively. Um, so you know, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, 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 did, I didn't pick out those particular ones because I think actually this panel probably knows quite a lot about uh, the obesity and, and physical activity or, already, but they are, you know, you're, you're absolutely right, really, really important. And, and the work that you, you, your organisation does is really, is really valued. Thank you. Neil, did you want to speak to that or...? Well, no, I'm just, um, as a fellow cyclist, I, you know, I can't agree more in terms of the importance. And that's, I guess... I would just echo what you're saying. I think this health and wellbeing strategy is about trying to get to that place of prevention. We talk about inequalities and tackling the inequalities, which we haven't particularly discussed here, but we know there's an inequitable access in different parts of the borough for, for things, and we know that different communities, we have to work quite differently. And, uh, you know, Neil, you, you came to a previous session we did as one of our Healthy Greenwich Partnership public forums around physical activity and talked about the challenges for cycling and there was a lady there who said well I can't cycle anymore and he said but we have these tandem bikes and we can you know so that there are there are ways of doing things differently but it is going to require us as a community to work uh, differently but I'm um, I think the opportunity for us if we really want to genuinely shift the population health outcomes we need to do the work on food and physical activity they are absolutely key so I'm really delighted there and the mental health stuff a lot of mental health stuff is also linked into that space around isolation, which Francis mentioned earlier, and others. So it's about our connections as community, and that's why the neighbourhood work that I talked about earlier is so important. 
I know people want access to services, but if we only focus on that, we will actually miss the point around the wider piece. And so thank you for kind of reminding us about that. Um, it's, it's useful uh, to have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just one quick point. Um, Neil, was I correct in thinking you suggested a visit of this panel to the new health mental health hub in Plumstead? Yeah, if, if, you'd, if you'd want to do that, we could definitely organise that uh, for you as, as a group. If that's um, what you want to do, I mean, we can organise that for many different parts of the service. There's a lot of great things happening. We've got a new lymphedema service that started up in the borough recently. You know, there are many services that, that the panel members might want to, to see we could talk through. I'm seeing nods from everybody, so I think that would be something we would be interested in if that could be noted, Raymond. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to our two panellists on that item. I think we'll all agree that it was very informative and we probably will be very much interested in scrutinising it further as it's uh, implemented. And the final item on the agenda um, is simply to note that we are commissioning the next uh, items for our next meeting, which is on the 16th of November, which is two items regarding social care. So um, I could take that as noted. Thank you very much, panel. I'll close the meeting. <laughs>